Welcome back. So if you've been keeping up with the series, you know that we are on the last video and we are about to start this engine up. So for the moment I've all been waiting for, let's start this engine up. So where we had left off last time, we had just finished up looming the harness and looking really, really nice. I mean, yeah. So the only thing we have left to do now is we gotta work on the fuel system. So we have to get fuel to this motor and that's gonna be relatively simple. So what I went ahead and did is hit up eBay and we got the cheapest fuel pump I could find. I think it was like 25 bucks. So this is a knockoff Bosch was it 044 it's a 300 liter per hour it's a piece of junk but it will get us started they are loud and noisy and i've seen some people run them we actually have uh two of these on the mustang so the reason for two isn't really you know the horsepower it's when one of them fails and i didn't say if i said when one of them fails that we have a backup for it but these are just cheap knockoff Bosch 044 fuel pumps. We went ahead and wired a relay to it, so that relay is actually gonna get triggered by the five volt output on the harness, and that'll turn that on and give us 12 volts to the pump to activate it. So I'll put a diagram up on the screen real quick of how that's actually set up. So this is just a very simple 12 volt relay setup, and all it does is it uses the five volt reference and a ground source to trigger the connection from the battery to the fuel pump. So it'll give it full 12 volts and whatever it needs to draw for amperage. So 100% necessary. Taping it to the fuel pump is not, but we don't have anywhere else to put it. So this just makes it clean and easy. All right, so real quick, go ahead and show you the fuel system setup here we have. Now, as always, fuel jug right behind exhaust manifold. So if we backfire, we kill everybody. Yes. We'll just scoot that over here a little bit. So, <laughs> anywho, we now got the fuel pump mounted to the engine stand. So more tape and zip ties. Relays hooked up. And just to give you guys an idea of how this is actually gonna be set up, this is gonna be the positive 12 volt that runs directly to battery feed. And if we go down here, we have this running to the positive cable that runs back to the positive battery post from this jumper cable. So this will be getting 12 volts as soon as we uh, clamp that jumper cable down there, which it is actually connected right now. So it is getting 12 volts right now. However, it doesn't matter. It goes absolutely nowhere until it gets the signal from the green wire, which runs over here to the fuel pump control from the ECU. So as soon as the ECU gets power, this will go ahead and flip that switch in there and it'll connect this to the positive running up to the fuel pump. And then it will turn this on for, I believe, two second prime. Real simple, real easy setup. As for the fuel lines, we have a fuel feed going in here and it's gonna just gonna pull fuel from the tank through, up, and wee -woo -woo -woo, and then into the fuel line. And then since this is a return style setup, we do have to dump back into the fuel tank. So, real simple setup, real easy, using an inline pump. Inline pump, relay, all you need, and some fuel lines, which is probably the most expensive part. I actually think the, some of this fuel line was actually more expensive than the pump itself, but it is what it is. So that's gonna be the fuel setup on there. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and start working on getting the PCM ready to do the standalone startup. Now, there's a lot we could cover in here, but we're not gonna get that far in depth into it. We just need to work on the most important part, and that's disabling VATS. Everything else is kind of secondary to this. We don't need to do anything else really to run this. I can touch on a few things, but primarily we're here disabling the vehicle anti-theft. Otherwise, you will not be able to start this. Well, you might be able to start it, but it will die immediately. 
When we go into HP tuners, we're going to open up the current tune and we're going to head over here to system tab. Once we're in system, you're going to see the very first tab is general and we're going to have vats. On the gen threes, you're going to see it set to serial. So we're just going to click this drop down box and set it to none. So now that it's disabled, all we have to do is save and write this tune and it's ready to go. Now, since we are doing a standalone setup, I will touch on a few other aspects here and that's the fans. If you're doing a standalone setup, you're probably doing electric fans. So that was the portion where we repurposed one one pin and add another pin to control the electric fans. So if we click over here on the fans, now this portion is super simple. All you're gonna do is go over here to fans and now we're either gonna do an auxiliary fan or two fans. We'd set it up for two fans, so we're gonna select two. Now, since we did set it up for two fans, we are gonna go over here to the AC tab. So this is the one where we actually repurposed a pin from the AC bundle, and then that's actually for the recirculation. And we're gonna say fan number two. So now we're taking that away from AC and turning it to fan number two. All right, so other than this, the only thing we really need to do is trigger when these fans go on and off. So back over here on the fans tab, we're gonna go ahead and start with fan one, and that's gonna go off. So the off is at what point we tell it that we want it to turn off because it got cool enough. So we're gonna say 195 is gonna be our point for turning this fan off, and we want it to come on at say 200. So once it hits 200 degrees, this fan is gonna turn on and it will not turn off again until it hits 195. So fan two is your second stage. We're gonna say it can turn off at 200, so the same temp that this one turns on, this one would turn back off. We're gonna set that at about 205. So this one will come on as soon as it hits about 205 and fall off again once it gets below 200. Once it gets below 200, uh, the first fan will still be running and that one will not turn off until it gets below 195. So you can actually play around with these depending on the temp you want. This is the way I actually have the BMW currently set and it works really, really well for that setup. So we're just gonna start with this and you would adjust this accordingly based on how your radiator is performing on your build. So it's something to keep an eye on. But once we're done with that, we really have everything we need and honestly, security is the only thing we really need to deal with for this instance, but I felt I should also touch on a few of these since they're in the same area. Other than that, the only thing we're really looking at is under engine diagnostic, and that's just going through, and we're gonna disable some of these P codes because we don't need them, like the downstream L2 sensors have been deleted, the EGR valve has been deleted, the EVAP system has been deleted. So all of those will throw some codes that can cause runnability issues with it not being plugged in and not seeing it, not being able to do a readiness test on it. This is all dependent, like I said, what you've removed, what you've deleted, you know, what's applicable for your current build. So all we do for these is we're gonna go through, find out exactly which one. Bank one sensor two means that's the downstream. Bank one sensor one are the ones we kept. So so the only ones you should keep on for these P codes are going to be the ones for the O2 sensors that are on bank one and two, sensor one. Anything sensor two, you're just going to go through and tell it no error reported, disable the SES, which is the service engine soon. So that keeps the light from going on. So you just go through here anytime you see a sensor two, no error reported, no error reported. So disable SES, no error reported. We're going to do that for everyone that is not a sensor one. Other than that, that's really all we're doing. For the purposes of running this on a stand, there's nothing else for us to really worry about within here, and we don't even have to do this. It'll still start. This is one thing to keep in mind, you're gonna wanna go through here, and the easiest way to actually do this is run the engine and then scan for codes, and you'll see everything that you need to disable, and you just go through the P codes and choose everything that you're not using and go ahead and disable it. So that'd be about probably the easiest way to find everything, otherwise you have to kind of search through here and know what you're looking for. But anyways, we're gonna go ahead and save this one. We're gonna write the tune, and then we're gonna be able to start this engine. Now that we have this tune saved, we're gonna go ahead and write it to the vehicle. It's very simple. Make sure you have power on to the ECU. We're gonna go ahead and click this uh, right vehicle button here, right calibration, and we're gonna change this to right entire. Well, now be careful. Make sure the vehicle does not lose power. Make sure your computer does not lose power. Everything needs to be plugged in and on a charger because if it disconnects for any reason during this write process, you will brick the ECU. This is practically unrecoverable. I, mean, I believe there's some special services out there, but be very careful. You do have to do a write entire to disable VATS though. So we're gonna click write. So now it's gonna access the ECU. All right, so once it's all completed, it will say write complete. And this write button will actually go from being grayed out to being usable again. You can at this point close this out. And at this point, you are cleared to disconnect the computer from the ECU. And at this point, we are ready to start the motor. 
Now, for those of you guys who follow us quite often and watch a lot of our videos, you know that we are super, super serious when it comes to safety. <laughs> but all joking aside, starting an engine on a stand can be a little dangerous. So I really do wanna go over a few things and make sure you guys are fully aware of things to keep in mind and look for when you're doing this, all right? So first and foremost, I see a lot of people doing this. I see a lot of people doing these engine stand startups and the first thing you see, so they hit that starter and this thing cranks over and it fires. And as soon as it fires, you see the entire engine rock sideways. So the biggest thing with that is there is a pin on these engine stands for you to pin them to keep them from moving. The thing is, look at how much slop this has. This pin is really, really small. So it gives you a lot of room for the engine to turn before it bottoms out on that pin. So this engine weighs quite a bit and it has a lot of torque, especially when it starts up. If it gets enough rotational force before bottoming out on that pin, there is a very real chance that this thing can flip over, okay? So one of the things I always do when I'm setting these up is I strap them down. So put a bolt in the motor mount location here, ratchet strap down, wrap it around a couple times, and then up to the other side, and then tighten it. I wanna make sure that it can't bounce, it can't move. I actually kind of pull the engine down until all the bounce is taken out of it and then make it so that that can cannot rotate at all. We've done about four or five of these engine stand startups. Never once dropped a motor. So I know it probably won't happen, but really it's just something that I'm not going to take a chance with. Now we do have fuel lines. We have wiring. We have everything running back here and we have the flex plate wide open. Keep an eye on your wires. There's a reason I tie everything up and out of the way. I make sure that everything is positioned so that it is not going to fall into the starter. I make sure all my wires are tucked back. I use a lot of the engine stand to make sure that everything is out of the way. I make sure I'm routing everything that's on the outside of the motor mounts here and make sure that nothing is near the flex plate. All sides, I make sure everything is above it where it can't physically get in, especially make sure that these plates are pushing them away. If they're anywhere near it, get them tied up, get them out of the way, because it's not gonna take a lot for that to grab a wire or a fuel line and just rip it to shreds. Now, especially that we're talking about fuel line, we are working with an open canister of gas back here, and we are working with open headers. If at all possible, if you're just doing it for an engine stand startup, you know, and you're gonna put it back to stock later, one of the best ways to do it flip your exhaust manifold to point forward. It's just a little bit of uh, extra security there that you're not gonna have a major issue. But for us, we're running them like this, but it's actually kind of hard to see. And if I can get a shot of this, you see they're actually pointing down and out and they're actually put, not pointing anywhere near the gas can. It's just really hard to get a view of, it looks like it's pointing right at it, but it's actually pointing completely the opposite direction. Same thing with this one over here. This one actually is kicking completely out to the side there. So well, we're gonna actually run it because we're not starting it right now with this. It'll probably be somewhere right about here. So it's actually in no danger of actually getting hit, but just be aware, be aware where your gas can is. If you can do a sealed setup, do a sealed setup, you're probably better off. Be fully aware where that's at. We're also gonna do something to actually seal off the top of this. I don't like leaving it wide open like this and then having just a bunch of fumes in here. Uh, two reasons. One, I don't want to bring all that in. Two, you don't want to be making like some arcs and sparks, especially from the starter right next to open can of gas. So just be aware of these things. Just my two cents on that. All right, so before we fire this up, I do want to just go ahead and give you guys a quick rundown of what we're doing with the electrical system and how it's actually set up here. I'll just give you a quick once over now that everything is connected and kind of show you what we're doing here. So we're actually running this positive line is going to running directly yep, to the starter. So this is the main block of the starter. This is where you're always going to connect a direct battery feed to because this one is going to want to be the one that always needs an uninterrupted connection from the batteries. We're connected to the bottom lug of the starter. And then this is actually would be your normally your purple wire that sends signal to the starter relay to go ahead and start firing it up. But in the meantime, we actually have these two wires running down to a push button starter. So all this is doing is when I press that button, it's jumping this connection. I know you've probably seen people start a motor or jump the starter by just taking a screwdriver and connecting those two leads. Uh, it's doing the same thing. So this is exactly what you're doing when you're turning the key anyways. So that's gonna be our quick starter setup. This is just our push button to roll the starter over and then we let go once it fires up. Other than that, we have 
the ECU powers that we talked about earlier. So these are all the positive 12 volt wires we were talking about before that need to see 12 volts in order to run the engine. And they're just running down to this switch here. That way we can actually flip it on and off. And right now it's on the off position. If I flip it on, we'll hear the uh, fuel pump prime and we'll be able to actually fire the engine up. So if we hit that push button over there without having this on, then it'll just crank, crank, crank and nothing will start. If we flip this on first, we'll be able to fire it up. But then this one just runs the other side of this back down to that positive connection there. So this section of the switch is getting a constant 12 volt lead. Well, this one's switched off right now. So once we flip this on, we'll be able to crank the car and fire it up. And then when we want to shut it off, we just flip the switch back off. So other than that, that's all we're really using. This is why we call this a three wire setup because it really is three wires. We have positive, we have the ground clamp directly to the back of the block and we have a starter wire, that's it, three wires. Since I'm sure you guys are really sick of hearing me jaw jack all this time without actually seeing any action, let's go ahead and start it up. All right, million dollar question, will it run? Let's do it. All right, and give it some power. All right, we got primed. I'm not seeing gas flying out anywhere, so. Moment of truth, guys. Let's do it. You heard it here first, guys. The blown up 5.3 lives. This thing was blown up in the BMW about, what, six months ago? No, not even maybe. Blown up. JB welded back together. JB welded, guys. And it fired right back up. Such a beast. It barely even took any cranking on this thing and it just fired right up. Idled perfectly smooth. Love it. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video series as much as I enjoyed making it. So what do you guys want to see next? Uh, I want to think about shaved intake. Want to do a DIY on a shaved intake? Anything else you guys can think of? Drop it in the comments below. Don't forget, like, comment, subscribe. Hit that bell. Thanks for watching, guys.